Hey now, it's Rob from Rob School of Music, and on today's podcast, we have the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Adam Neely. Stick around for an amazing interview talking about the life of a professional musician, YouTuber, performer, writer, all around great dude. See you on the other side. Welcome to the Rob School of Music podcast where we sit down and talk to musicians, entertainers, and creators from all over the world. Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in today. As always, my name is Rob from Rob School of Music. On today's show, we have Adam Neely. When we were trying to put together people for this podcast and for this interview series, Adam was one of the top people on the list. A drummer that I play with by the name of Gandhi Gonzalez was friends with Adam and performed a couple of weddings with him years back. So that's our six degrees of separation wanted to bump into Adam when we were out at NAMM this past January, but the stars did not align. But I'm happy to say that we were able to connect via email and get him in for the show. Most of you probably recognize Adam from YouTube, but he also has an amazing band that just finished a tour of India late last year called Sungazer. He has a horn-centric band called the Aberdeen, and he plays in the New York Chill Harmonic. On YouTube, Adam has over a million subscribers, And his major claim to fame and where I first found him was his performing of The Lick for five hours straight. Adam's videos are incredibly musically dense and educational, and he makes the most complex subjects easy to understand for even the most lay of laymen. We talk about all sorts of things ranging from his practice schedule to books that have shaped him, and our students here at the school submitted some amazing questions as well. Without further ado, let's jump right in. Ladies and gentlemen, my conversation with Adam Neely. Why, hello there. How's it going? There he is. Legend of Shred. (laughs) Yes. yes. You like that (laughs) intro, man? Sorry? A king of greatness. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. The uh, (laughs) flattery will get you many places in life, especially flattery. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It's very good to be here. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, dude. I mean, you know, it's... Incredible to be able to, you know, bring you to our students and stuff. I actually, um, a drummer I play with, Gandhi Gonzalez. Did Gandhi. Some oh, yeah. yeah. He, he plays in my, we do weddings and things. He plays in our band. And then he uh, had wonderful things to say about you. Yeah, that guy's, that guy's a, f- a really funny guy. Um, I haven't seen him in a second, but uh, that's, yeah. that's a cool uh, connection. <laughs> yeah, so that's our six, you know, degrees. But yeah. So cool, man. So I'm going to ask questions because we've got a million questions. If that's of all course, right. yeah, let's do it. All right. Uh, so right off the bat, like, what's your what's your practice routine like? Like, daily? well, yeah, daily practice routine. Um, it honestly changes, and the the thing that I've always noticed for myself is that once I get into the like, once you get into the world of you know professional music, whatever that might be. You know, you might have gigs coming up, you might have different recording sessions, you might have different writing sessions. And so a big part of like staying focused is just keeping some kind of like degree of practice steady because, you know, things will be changing all over the place. So some days I might be practicing, you know, this music, some days I might be practicing this music. But the thing that I always kind of go back to is I really like playing along with Stevie Wonder songs and playing bass transcriptions of Stevie Wonder songs because of a lot of reasons that keeps me very like in tune with some of the kinds of syncopation, some of the kinds of like um, rhythmic feels that I would do on a daily basis where, you know, playing funk tunes on bass. Um, I, I, so I practice like, do I do? I play along to that song and I uh, practice uh, like superstition sometimes. So things that I know are very good for me because they in make make some kind of like statement about the rhythm that I'm you know going through. Um, but beyond that, I definitely still will practice scales. I'll go up and down major scales and different inversions of different arpeggios. Uh, for the most part, though, it's it's kind of all over the place. <laughs> it's it, having a daily routine has been kind of a struggle, honestly, because there's so much going on. But I play every day at, at least a couple hours, so. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's something we're always trying to say to the students here. Like, as long as the instrument is in your hand, oh yeah, you're getting something out of it. You know, like I say, if I assign you with a certain assignment and you don't play it, but you played for ten hours, I'm happy you did something. Yeah, there's. I mean, just having the instrument with you, it becomes more a part of you the longer you stay with it. I mean, it's really just a question of time. 
if you're spending a lot of time with it, you will improve and you will have a much deeper connection with the music that you're making. Totally. Yeah. Awesome, dude. Um, all right. So you guys just had a pretty epic uh, tour overseas. What was like the coolest part of that and the worst part of that? Yeah, we were in India, um, which was wild because I've never been to India before. Um, it's a very different country from the US in so many different ways. And yet it felt very much like home playing with um, the venues that we were playing. We played in Mumbai, we played in Delhi, we played in Goa, uh, Jaipur. We played in all these cities and the kinds of people were coming out to hang out and check out you know, our music. We're you know, huge fans of jazz fusion. They're fusion, like fans of the band Sungazer and Shrib Saran, uh, the bands that we're touring with. And it was, it was just a very different experience because, um, well, just it's a very different country and the kinds of, um, you know, it's a very crowded country. There's a lot of stuff happening all over the, all over the place. And it's just kind of remembering to stay focused and stay, you know, you know, stay focused on the music. And that was kind of a challenge, but at the same time, it was an amazing experience. Um, so it was a lot of fun and people seemed to really dig the music, which was great. That's awesome, man. Yeah. How's the food? How's the food? I love it. Oh, the food. Best part. Best part. Yeah. Hands down. I mean, my, my stomach took, didn't really agree with me most of the time, but everybody else, everybody in the band was like, the bands were like, oh my God, my stomach's going to hate me, but I can't stop eating. It's so good. Every meal was like life-changingly good. I, wow. I love Indian food. It was so good. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I'm seeing there's, some of these comments are absurd. I, oh, I, Yeah. They yeah. come with the territory. I'm That's, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's hysterical to me. If I ever, like, I peer down and I giggle, it's just, like, I'm watching my students asking things and the random things, and then they're jumping on the random, and it's, there's lots of tangents down there. But we'll yeah, get that there. <laughs> um, so a big thing a lot, like, we're a music school, so our students range from five to in their 80s. And, um, you know, all different levels, all different skill levels. And a big question is anxiety. Like, yeah. Safety. So, so, you know, you're doing gigs from all ranging in sizes all over the place. Sometimes you jump from a gig to a gig to a gig. Like, how do you keep your bearings? Well, the anxiety and the thing with stage fright, I've always said it, it's by doing something a lot, you start to lose that anxiety and stage fright. So by just going through the motions, physically doing it. It's not, it's not even a mental thing. It's because you are doing something that influences your thought patterns. And it, it does take a lot to get outside of your head, especially when you're on a stage, especially when you're so exposed in front of everybody and you're feeling like you're judged and you're feeling so scared and you don't want to do, do that. Um, for me right now, I don't have that kind of stage fright so much anymore, just because I've done it a lot. And I know that the worst possible thing that, I could, that could ever happen is that I look a little silly. I look a little dumb because if something goes wrong. But stuff has gone, gone wrong plenty of other times before in my past. I've made really bad mistakes, really like horrid mistakes. Um, my favorite example of this recently is, um, I was playing with this band called the 8-Bit Big Band, which does all of these like um, video game music covers, but like with a huge orchestra. And it's run by this guy named Charlie Rosen. And it's really, really awesome. And all, the musicians he get to, gets to play these video game covers are all these Broadway musicians who are just absolutely fantastic. They can sight read anything perfectly. Probably some of the best musicians on a technical level that I've ever gotten the chance to play with. And I was playing, um, and I was a bass soloist for a couple of these tunes where I was playing some like um, basically solo bass numbers kind of as the soloist. And I get on stage with bass that had new strings on it and the, like completely out of tune. I thought that I had tuned it backstage, but by the time that I actually got on stage, it was insanely out of tune, like nowhere near the, like, the right tuning. And the piece started with like just a solo bass harmonics. So it was just all eyes on me. And then the tuning, like in a, a, it was at Sony Hall, so it was like four or five, 500 people there. Everybody's like focused on me and the tuning is completely <laughs> off. No. And it's just like way out of, you know, not even close. Um, so, you know, that's the silliest. It looked really bad. I looked really bad in front of all these Broadway musicians who I like really look up to or like these guys are so cool. And then this whole like audience is just looking at me fail really miserably. But I had had experiences like that a lot before where I just failed like very bad, very bad. It does not look good on me. Um, and I realized that the worst that could happen is that I look kind of dumb and that's it. 
nobody's getting hurt. Nobody is losing their life over this. The, you will get a chance to play again and you will get a chance to redeem yourself. You are your own worst critic in every circumstance. So part of it is just having the courage to get up on stage and feel comfortable in your own skin. And that's very hard, but by doing it over and over and over again, that, that, this happened a couple months ago. And if this was at the beginning of my career, this would have been the worst experience that I've ever had. But I honestly just remembered it right now because <laughs> I, it's so far in the past, I don't care about it, you know? So it, I do experience it, but because I've done it a lot, it's not a big deal. Music is, is supposed to be fun. And if I can make it fun for myself, I'm going to make it fun for myself. Totally, man. That's, that's a perfect answer. I mean, I'm only, I, I put a video on Instagram today of me singing a song, and I'm the furthest thing from a singer. But I wanted to show, like, it's okay to be vulnerable, and it's part of the process. And, you know, you can document that now and see the journey, and that, that's a cool thing. And mistakes happen, and shit goes wrong. And totally. Yeah, and th I mean, I've thought about doing that because I'm not a good singer at all. But congratulations to you for doing that because I'm we'll terrible. <laughs> <laughs> the jury's still out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so terrified of it. Oh, well, we'll see. We'll see what the response is. People are like, yeah. And I'm like, but really? Are you sure? <laughs> um, all right. So, so many of these questions are going to be super like theory and like gear stuff. So I'm going to get the one that's not that way out of the way. Uh, what was your first record and what was your first concert? Uh, my first record was, I, I'm pretty sure it was the first one that I bought myself with my own money was um, Offsprings Americana. Um, <laughs> which uh, like 90s, I guess early 2000s, 90s, yeah, 90s alt rock band. Uh, love that, love that album. I bought it in France when I was on a, like a field trip, I guess. Um, wow. And I brought it back and I was very excited to listen to it. And after that, it was, I think, a Rage Against the Machine album. Then the first concert I ever went to with like, without my parents or just like the first like rock concert was this thing called the HF Festival, um, which was the local radio station put on this big, big, festival at uh, RFK Stadium in Washington, D.C. And uh, let's see, I saw Papa Roach. I saw, uh, who else did I see? Sum 41, like all of these like 90s alternative rock bands. Mm -hmm. And it was awesome. I had such a good time. there. <laughs> yeah, man, that's my first show was uh, in our town. There's a community college and No Doubt was playing there. I'm like Ooh, 95, nice. 96, like Tragic Kingdom album. Yeah. And people were moshing to Don't Speak. And like, I try and make that reference to, uh, you know, kids and they're like, that's like Blake Shelton's girlfriend, right? I'm like, yes, that, that's who that girl is. Yes. Oh, no, no, <laughs> that's uh, not the right, not the right answer. <laughs> no, but it, you know, it, it all starts somewhere, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are you still doing like the, uh, the wedding gigs and stuff? Like did... very, very infrequently. Um, I, I miss doing them honestly, because it, it the wedding gigs, they're exhausting. They, um, you know, it, sometimes you don't play music that you enjoy, but for the most part, you're playing music with musicians that are really, really good. And it's a great way of building, uh, your chops. Like whenever, when I was doing those weddings regularly, like I could play bass very well because I had these, you know, wedding, wedding band chops of just playing for four hours straight. And it was great. And it was a lot of fun. I'm not doing it so much anymore just because I'm focusing more on YouTube related things and also touring for like my band um, but for a working musician th those wedding gigs are good they're really good and i recommend anybody looking to get into the world of like working musician uh, to look into that sort of thing because it's it's great i i love it i love doing it yeah, yeah man it, it, it's it's the coolest thing because you got to be able to be good at every genre like everything's thrown at you and that's hard yeah and one of the things is there's there's always still a stigma I've always found, especially with people who haven't done those sorts of things about wedding gigs, but every musician I know, every musician in the New York scene has done them or does them and understands the value of them and what, you know, the, what's necessary because there are so many musicians involved and, you know, there's so much demand, um, you know, the, the caliber, the caliber of musicianship needs to be incredibly high. You'd be going from playing like Bruno Mars to like an Italian wedding song to, right. you know, ACDC back to back to back. And 
you know, it needs to sound like the record and the musicians need to be able to do that like at a moment's notice. And that's hard and it requires a phenomenal amount of flexibility. So um, yeah, it's kind of a proving grounds, I think. It's like trial by yeah. fire for musicians, for sure. 100%. Yeah. Um, so a lot of our kids are going off to college and a lot of them are like, I wanna to go to school for music. I have a degree in music, you know, same thing. Like, do you see value in that now? Or I do, and I think the real value of school, um, at like formal education, any kind of education, is the ability to talk with your peers and your ability to um, make communities. Basically, um, I was just watching a interview with uh, I think no, it wasn't Jack Stratton, Theo, Theo Katzman, one of the uh, like Wolfpack guys, and he was talking a lot about the value of scenes. So like the value of a um, um, just getting a bunch of people together who are like-minded and learning from each other and growing with each other and just growing and developing something that, you know, you're in, a, you're in an environment with people who are very passionate about music. And so going to music school is good for that. You can get information anywhere, but information is not the same thing as learning and learning, you know, comes from many different ways and information is important for that. But at the same time, learning is much more about it. it how you interact with other people, I feel like. And so I think that's the real value of music school. Um, you can get information anywhere, like I said, it's the internet age, but there's a reason why music schools still continue to exist and why people still go to them. It's because they find real value in that kind of community. So. Totally. Yeah. Awesome. I, I'm, I see a couple of names in here that, that really they needed to see that. So thank you for- Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm glad that that was, that was useful for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of our students, his name is Franklin. He he literally made an Instagram just to watch this. Oh, cool. And uh, he wanted to ask you, you know, how is the whole quarantine thing affecting, you know, your gigs? And then how do you foresee it affecting the future of gigs? It's a heavy well, question right now. But. Yeah. Okay. So basically it, it completely, you know, I was supposed to be on tour. I was supposed to just be finishing a tour with Sun or my band right now. I was going to be touring like a couple weeks ago with my band, another band, Aberdeen. I was supposed to be going to Germany to do some gigs in a couple of days. Like, you know, all my, all my tours and everything for the, um, have been canceled. They've been canceled all throughout the summer. It might be canceled in the fall. Who knows? So obviously it was very inconvenient for me because I had a whole year planned and now it's all kind of gone, gone away, which is, I'm, I'm kind of lucky because I can make YouTube videos and, collaborate in other ways, but it, you know, completely destroyed the music industry for this spring. It's going to affect the music industry for years, for sure. And it's fundamentally changed people's faith, I think, in the ability for them to have consistent work through performing. And that, that's, you know, it's hard. I, I mean, I, I'm curious what you think in terms of like, um, and what you've seen too, because you, you know, you're connected to the New York music scene. For me, it's like, everybody lost everything. Yeah. And so it's been kind of hard to, hard to see that. Um, it, 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 it's, it's horrifying and devastating and unfathomable all at once. Like I kept all of it. Like, so my gig is I do an acoustic thing with my girlfriend, she sings, and then we'll bring in other musicians for bigger things like Gandhi or other people like that. There's a kid in here, JP Listella, sick bassist. Um, we'll bring him in there. And, and I'm like talking to the people that I normally would supply the work for. I'm like, I, I don't know, and they know it too, but like I feel this guilt and all yeah. the dates are still on the calendar. So I'm getting like alerts, like, you know, this gig was this day, and then I start adding up the money. And I'm like, holy crap, it, it's, I it, can't yeah. wrap my head around, how is it gonna get better? <laughs> yeah, and you know, businesses are, it's not all just gonna come flooding back once we are, we're allowed to, like assuming best case scenario, like things start to open up in like a month or so. Um, all that work is gone and it's right. about re rebuilding it. And, you know, if you're contracting work, you want to be able to contract musicians. You want to be able to like give people gigs, but you know, there's no gigs to give. And it, 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 it shows how, um, it shows how reliant the music industry has been for a long time, or at least the working musician industry has been for a long time on bars and restaurants. Cause that's traditionally where you go to see music bars and restaurants. Um, 
concerts and things like that will open up a little bit faster, I think. But um, at weddings, people are always going to get married. Like that's that's fine. But it's going to be, you know, it's a it's a pretty devastating sort of event. Um, no, like no two ways around that. Um, but fortunately, I haven't been as affected as some other people. Yeah, yeah. we have one of one of the guys who uh, teaches here. He's the strictly weddings, and they lost like everything. Yeah. And now the makeup dates are into next year, but those dates are already booked with other things. So it's like there's no way out of it. Yeah, and everybody's been saying also like this fall is going to be the busiest fall of all time because everything is going to get mushed right. together, so and then that's yeah. you know, <laughs> it's going to be kind of crazy. But all right, positive things. We'll put that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what's uh, what's your favorite piece of gear? Oh. I hate getting asked that because I, I have no idea how to answer it. Well, I, I love answering it because the way that I answer that is I say my favorite piece of gear is my Fender Mexican key bass, which is an instrument that I bought in 2010. And it's been my main ax for a very long time. I've since kind of retired it because I've been playing my Kiesel JB5 a lot more. But it's just a simple piece. It's a simple Mexican made Fender bass. It's like the simplest thing ever. Um, and the reason why I like it so much is because I know it's history. Like I know exactly how it plays. Uh, some, there's some dead spots on the neck, which might annoy some people, but I know those dead spots and I know how to play around those dead spots. I know like this note is the note that I really want to hit at this moment because I know how its frequency resonates with the rest of everything. And I just know that piece of gear very, very well. Um, and so because of that, I think I, I have that deeper connection to it. I really, really enjoy that bass. Um, that said, I also very much enjoy, uh, my boss OC2 octave pedal, just because it sounds really, really cool. <laughs> um, I think that gear is something that you should know. Like, it's very important to know gear. You can have shitty gear. You can have, excuse me, you have bad gear. You can have, uh, we're musicians. We say words. Yeah. I'm sorry. You can have bad gear. You can have great gear, but unless you know how it works, it doesn't matter how good it is. Um, and my Fender Mexican P bass is technically, I mean, it's not bad. It's just like not pro level, but I love it so much because I know exactly how it works. Yeah. Cool. We, um, last week I was talking to Hanan Rubenstein who plays with Alicia Keys mm. and uh, asked the same question. And I see his videos. This guy has a million amazing guitars. And he said his ears are his favorite piece of gear. I thought that ah. was a brilliant answer. <laughs> That's... <laughs> It's a cop out, but yeah, I'll start saying that. <laughs> yes, yes. I was like, I wanted to pull like a fifty-nine Les Paul or something, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's it, and I know why because people sometimes get the wrong impression when they see really, really nice pieces of gear. They think they need that piece of gear in order to become a great musician, and the great musicians who own those really nice pieces of gear know that that's not the case. But it's hard to not correlate. You know, if you are a great musician and you have a piece of great piece of gear it's an easy way to say like well there must be some correlation but in this case you know it's important i think for a lot of people to distance themselves from nice pieces of gear because they don't want people to get the wrong impression and they don't want people to focus on more fundamental aspects of musicianship and relationship to gear rather than the nice piece of shiny thing itself right so that's a great answer your ears <laughs> yeah i thought i was like Okay, like it's, immediately I was like, that's a cop out because I wanted to see something fancy because I'm nerdy in that way. But of course, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, before I'm going to, there's going to be a bunch of theory questions. I'm saving them for the end. Um, All right, sure. What, uh, if you had to say one book that changed your life in terms of interpreting and understanding music what, what Ooh, yeah. i know you did a youtube video with a bunch of books about every single one as soon as i finished but um <laughs> if there was one yeah. yeah um there one one of those books uh i would say and it's very very dense um this book called harmonic experience by wa matthew and it changed my relationship to music because it made me think about the sounds that i was hearing so this this book is a textbook and it's it's dense and it's very technical but this, um, this composer wrote, a, he is a Western composer. He's like a classical composer, but he went and studied music, studied singing in India for 15 years. And then he came back to Western music and he started hearing Western music in a very different way. You know, the way that we like hear, hear sounds, hear piano, hear guitar. Um, 
we just have a very, we, we understand these sounds very intimately, but at the same time, we don't give much thought to them. Like, why do we have 12 notes? Why do we have the major scale? And honestly, we don't need to know because it just sounds good to us. But this book started making me think a little bit more about why it sounds good and why we use the notes that we do and gets very, very deep into a lot of the, the math behind all this stuff. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a really interesting book. And for my, for my own, um, for my own experience, it was important for me at getting it at the time that I did. I think with any piece of book or any piece of book, any piece of gear, any book, it needs to come to you at the right time. Because if I didn't, if I read this book before I was ready for it, it probably wouldn't have changed my outlook. But I read it at the exact right moment that I felt like I needed to, to read this. There are other books that I might recommend that didn't change my perspective as drastically that might change other people's perspectives. Um, but at the same time, this was that book, Harmonic Experience. Cool. Well, I believe I have that one. And it yeah. is I'm curious for you. Uh, um, has there you been know, any book for you or? There, there was a, so I went to college. I was at Ramapo College in New Jersey. They had a tiny little music program, but um, the teacher who taught all the theory classes, his name is Richard Source, and he had a book and it was his textbook we used. It's this obnoxious purple color. It's like music in our time. I can't remember the name, honestly. I could grab it, it's in the back, but. Richard was, Source. Richard Source was his name, yeah. And then um, it just opened my, like I played music probably since I was 13. But I don't care about theory prior to that. I wanted to learn Metallica songs and get the hottest girl and all those things. All the wrong things. <laughs> and then um, once I got into school, you know, it was just shoved in my face. And I was like, wow. And it just made sense. And that yeah. kind of like opened me up to other things. But that, I don't know if it was the most changing one, but it was definitely the one that just like, wow, music. It was like unzipping it and stepping inside of it and overwhelmed by it. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. And you, you can, that's kind of what I mean about like you cut a book comes to you at the right moment or like you'll connect with something. You'll find some like hidden understanding about music. Um, only if you're at that right moment, because there are other books that, um, I like, I think they're cool, but they just didn't affect me because I had already understood their, um, I already understood it. The information wasn't new to me. Um, or the music was, or the information is so advanced and so opaque that I just don't understand it. Like there's, um, well, I don't want to say, I don't want to like cite anything specific, but you know, some of the more advanced music theory, like that is studied at like the doctoral level. I have no idea what the hell these guys are going on about, but it's, you know, it's something that um, maybe one day I will. So anyway. <laughs> I mean, I think it's cool. Like, you know, at the school here we have, a shelf in the back and it's just full like i just buy every book I can get my hands on and That's i'll let awesome. the students take them like here take this it's like i think i try and be in that role where i'm like hey we just had an epic lesson i think this chapter would mean something to you take this yeah. home check it out and uh that, that's sometimes cool... the books never come back but <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's still a cool like thing i, I you know i i definitely um my base teachers in high school were very influential for me or two of them, Pepe and Gonzalez and Leonardo Lucini. And they always had a, an album to lend me and maybe I didn't return it all the time. Right. But they always like, you should check this out. And that, that was a special like moment I always found like when the teacher recommended or gave me something. Oh. Um, so that's cool to be able to do that with, with, with books. Yeah, I love it. Um, okay, off of theory, um, your YouTube videos are fantastic. You know, you over a million followers. You're, like I said, a champion, king of greatness. Um, what, when you're producing the, the content, like what, how much time goes, and I'm sure it's different on each one, but like, do you storyboard the ideas and then put them together or what's the process? Well, it, depend, it depends on the kind of content that I'm making. Um, certain videos, I'm actually going to be bringing up um, a final cut timeline that I can show you guys give you the behind the scenes, what these projects look like. Um, if I can find it, uh, but it, it really depends. So I'll, I'll script out things for like bigger projects. I'll script out, I'll write out every word that I ever will say. And then when I'm recording it, I'll like memorize a sentence 
and I'll deliver the sentence a couple times to the camera, make sure I get a good take, and I'll go to the next sentence, and then I'll memorize that sentence, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then, you know, I'll, I'll get the script all written out, and then I'll, like, start editing it and throw it in the final cut. And then these are, this is kind of what a, a timeline looks like for me. So basically, I'll be editing, there'll be all kinds of different little animations and things that I'll, like, add. And if anybody does Final Cut, or if anybody does Final Cut, and also works in digital audio workstations, you kind of realize that there's this musical aspect to video editing, in terms of trying to get the timing right, and trying to get the right takes, and trying to piece things together the same way that you would in like GarageBand, or Logic, or Ableton Live. And so I get a lot of kick out of putting together videos, because I'm thinking of them very musically. Like, how do I get the timing right? It's all about timing, and how, getting the feeling of certain things. So it takes a lot of time. It takes many, many, many hours. Um, for certain videos, it might take, all told, 40 or 50 hours worth of work through the research, through the script editing, through the filming, through everything. And, you know, that's, that's for me. And, like, I'll do a video a week. So this is kind of like a, a full-time job. I mean, it is a full-time job. Um, for other videos, it might take a little bit less time because I'm talking a little bit more off the cuff. I'm reading questions and, like, interacting with you know, for Q&A videos, I might not try and script out anything, but it still takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. And people might not realize that, but another thing that I say is that making videos is kind of like making music. It requires a lot of time, a lot of energy, and you might not get um, gratification. There might not be instant gratification um, in the w way that you might be looking for. But if you spend the time and spend the energy and really practice your craft, you will get a very real gratification in your ability to do something that can only possibly be done if you put in the hours and put in the effort. And that's, you know, a, an important kind of like lesson that I'm trying to teach people about what it is I do on YouTube and relate it to what I do with music. They're kind of the same thing. They, they do get the same kind of, um, there is the same kind of lesson to be learned in both circumstances. That's actually really cool to say to draw the parallel between the two. And I, I can't help but do it. I'm a, yeah. I'm a musician, like, and I try and teach also music. And yeah. so it, it kind of feels, and feels like two sides of the same coin, just very different media. Because music is sound and video editing and stuff, it's a visual media. So it's a very different set of tools, but the same kind of approach is there too. And writing and recording a song and writing and recording a video. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite mode? Favorite mode? <laughs> <laughs> um, are we sticking to major modes or can we get... You know what? It's, 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 it, take it wherever okay. you want. All right. Favorite major mode is probably Dorian. I like Dorian a lot. It sounds good. Um, it's uh, radially symmetric, which means that if you take the note like C and then you build a perfect fifth up from C, and then a perfect fifth down from C, you get a G and an F. And if you keep going in fifths in either direction, you eventually get a C Dorian mode. I think that's just kind of a fun thing because we call it radially, radially symmetric. But my favorite mode overall is something called the Mixolydian flat six. And it's what it sounds like, it's the Mixolydian mode. So it's the fifth mode of the major scale, but then you have a lowered sixth degree. So um, it's, the, it's the fifth mode of the melodic minor. And the cool thing about Mixolydian flat six is that it's the same going up as it's going down. So if you build up um, a perfect, like a major second going up and a major second going down, major second going up, major second going down, minor second going up, minor second going down, etc., both versions yield a Mixolydian flat six scale. And not all scales do that. In fact, there are not that many else that do that. Um, wow. So I, I like... I like the, you know, the math behind it, but it also sounds pretty cool. If you like play a Mixolydian flat six, it just, it's a cool sound. I like it. Awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Um, so that's in math. You bring up math when you're interpreting music, when you're ingesting music, um, from the theory side of things, is math mm -hmm. always in the forefront of how you understand it? I, mean, uh, I know music is math, but no, no. Um, in fact, I get, I, so I've learned a lot of things about how I, I relate to music. And a lot of the time, 
uh, it's from the analytical perspective, which I almost am, I don't want to say embarrassed by, by this point, but I, I've kind of like want to not listen to music like that as much, where I'm trying to analyze it in terms of the harmonic content. I'm trying to listen to music more in terms of rhythmic content, timbral content, like the sounds that are happening. Um, but yeah, I mean, I will be able to listen to a piece of music and say like, oh yeah, that's the one chord going to the flat three, going to the four, and this is the melodic arc, and that's the one of the key, et cetera. And it's another way of interpreting and hearing the music. And the advantage of that is that you can then, when you're listening to music like that, it becomes very easy to then take the music that you just heard and just do it yourself because you have analyzed it and understand all the key relationships, understand it, you have understood all of the different harmonies and their relationship to the key. So this is the one chord, this is the four chord, this is the five chord, and it's an easy way of then being able to play it yourself. And that's the huge advantage of it. Um, you, you can definitely turn that side of the brain off for sure, and I do, but it's a nice tool to be able to do that. It, and it's a, a necessary tool in a lot of cases because it, the ability to reproduce music like that after just hearing it once, it's kind of necessary to kind of come up, especially with somebody who does not have perfect pitch. I don't have perfect pitch. It's necessary to be able to make those kinds of connections to be able to do it yourself. And I think that's, that's the power of it for sure. Awesome. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on perfect pitch there. Mm. Uh, we have a student here who has perfect pitch. Mm. They're not on here so I can speak freely. She walks around like she's a uh, hot shit. Yeah. And I say to her, that, that's, that's not necessarily a good thing. What are your thoughts on perfect pitch? I, I agree. I, I don't wish perfect pitch on anybody. And the, these are the disadvantages of perfect pitch. Um, I have a very good friend who is an incredibly smart musician and has perfect pitch. And the way that he hears music is not as the sound and the color of the chord itself. It's not this like just sound that you're experiencing. He's hearing like that's a C, E flat, G, B. And you, you can't turn that off. That's like a very, it's like immediately being aware of the color of everything you see. And that's the first thing that you think of, no matter what. For me, I, you know, when I walk into a room and when I see something, I, you know, take in the shapes of different things, like there's different like pieces of furniture or whatever, but to have perfect pitch would mean that the color of everything is the first and only thing that you think of immediately. So if you heard a chord, you don't hear the chord, you hear the notes, and then you have to analyze the chord knowing what the notes are. For somebody with relative pitch or for somebody with a developed ear, you're just like, well, it's a major chord. Like, how do you know? Well, I just know it's just major. It's major sounding. For somebody with perfect pitch, they'd have to think, okay, well, that's an A flat, a C, and an E flat, and A flat, C, E flat equals major chord. So it's a different relationship with things. And um, I don't think that that's a good thing. I think that you can develop the relative pitch side if you have perfect pitch, but in the long run, having a different relationship with the music, I think is, is better. And it, it, it's more holistic. Um, also, if you learn perfect pitch on an out-of-tune piano, you're screwed. And I've heard of people who do that. You're, oh you're done. You can't listen Sorry. to music anymore. <laughs> yeah. So that's, uh, that's my take on perfect pitch. I, I don't want it. I don't see it being useful for me. It'd be fun, but this, I don't want it. <laughs> this particular person, she's incredibly talented, but yeah. it gets in the way of her creative process because it's, it's too black or white. It's, it's like blocks. It's not, it doesn't flow. Yeah. And that's hard to watch. It's, it's interesting. It's fascinating because they have an ability that I don't have. And that ability seems like it would be a very, very useful thing for musicians. And you have all these great musicians all around us who have perfect pitch and they're able to do these insane things, but I still don't want it. I don't think that it's necessary. And I think that it would get in the way of how I relate to music. So that's, that's my take. Awesome, dude. Um, so in, Creative process. What's your creative process like? Um, uh, Ableton? Is it Logic? Is it? Is it? Do you start with the bass line, the melody? Like, it depends on the kind of music that I'm making. Um, and I found over the years that it, I like doing it many different ways. So if I'm, so my band is called Sungazer, and we make electronic music and electronic jazz related things. And the way that we do it is the drummer comes up with some kind of demo and sends it to me. And I write music on top of his drum beat, which is a really fun way of doing it. And I do everything in Ableton Live. I'll um, you know, 
bust out like the bass guitar and maybe come up with a bass line that might work with his drum groove or like come up and experiment with different samples like um I like electronic uh, like video game chip tune sorts of sounds um like nes emulators like sounds um sound card emulators i'll sometimes play with those um, but i do it very much like electronically like in ableton live but sometimes when i'm writing music for like or doing arrangements for like uh via like string quartet or if I'm doing an arrangement for like larger groups of acoustic instruments, I write everything in a music notation program called Sibelius. And then I, I just work within that program. And, you know, I'll always have like a little, little keyboard thing just to like bang out some notes just to help me out because I don't hear everything ahead of time, but it's just nice to be able to like play little things just to work on it. Um, there's so many different ways of doing it, but for Sungazer, I'm working entirely in Ableton Live. For any of my like pop reharmonization things, I'm working entirely in Sibelius. I don't normally start with a bass line. Actually, I very rarely start with bass guitar, even though that's my main instrument. Most of the time I'm working with a piano. And I think working with a piano is a very, very useful um, skill to have. I mean, it's, it's just like you got the 12 notes right there. It's right. easy to visualize in ways that it's much more difficult to visualize with guitar and bass, but um, it's still nice to be able to do it in multiple different instruments. Yeah, it's funny with the piano. We have, you know, in the school here, guitar, bass, drums, piano, voice, DJ, production. We, you know, run the gamut of it all. In every one of my lesson rooms, we have a piano because it's always a great visual reference because it's literally laid out in black and white music, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It, um, I had a professor who said that the piano is like the orchestra, but in black and white. And you know, of course, you could, visually, it's literally black and white, but it's also because you can play anything and everything. Like, right. It, it's not going to sound the same as a guitar player playing it, but you can just play the same notes. It's just like, it's in monochrome. Um, it's a very useful tool, and I, I recommend everybody get some kind of piano chops. Like, not you don't have to play crazy things, but, you know, being able to play some basic chords and be, basic scales, that goes a very, very long way. Um, for sure. Cool. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I saw a question. I missed it. So uh, one, one teacher at the school, his name is Gerard, and he is our resident theory wizard. And uh, <laughs> Gerard, what was that question? Hopefully he'll type it in again. Um, okay. <laughs> so do you think that you can become a professional, successful musician with com no knowledge of theory? Like not even knowing what a major triad is, just like nothing. Just all, this sounds good, this sounds good, this like. I think it's possible, but you have to, because you're working with so many other musicians who are using that language of like, this is a major chord, this is a minor chord. It'd be very difficult. Um, I think it's possible, but honestly, you're holding yourself back if you don't at least have some kind of basic understanding. And the reason for that is, is the theoretical knowledge that we're you know, talking about this is how you communicate with other musicians. This right. is the way that you have a meaningful conversation in English or using music theory with another musician. And you wanna communicate a music idea fundamentally so the other musician understands it and they're able to replicate it on their instrument and they know what it is that you're doing. This is the language, this is how we communicate with one another. So yeah, you can, you can make insane music knowing nothing about music theory. It's just gonna be harder to have any kind of meaningful conversation with the people that you're going to be playing with right. and that that will very much get in the way of your career in the long run um i know some fantastic musicians who don't have the like most crazy like you know they maybe didn't go to music school and so their faculty and their understanding of exactly what's going on is maybe not as high as mine but at the same time they're able to have some kind of conversation about rhythm about knowing what beat comes where like oh can you put that on the end of two for example and that's an important understanding to know, okay, well, the second B is being subdivided into eighth notes and that we're going to all play on that second eighth note. And that, you know, without having to actually say it or without having to hear it first, you can just say the end of two and everybody will know what that means. Right. Um, so I think it's important at least to have a working knowledge of music theory, Be, not for any kind of analytical reason. It's just so that you can talk with other people. It just makes life easier in the same language yeah yeah for sure all right so gerard's question for you is um he said it was a major scale with a flat sixth 
or I don't even know the flat six. What would you call that? <laughs> um, I've heard that called the harmonic major, and I don't know. Um, I don't use it that often, but in when, so I went to Berkeley College of Music, and for whatever reason, uh, for the performance majors, they had to learn the harmonic major in all of their modes. And I never quite understood that because it's not the most practical scale, but it's cool. It's fun. It's the major scale, but then you lower the sixth degree. It has a sound. It's kind of cool. It's a fun thing to play around with, but I've heard it called the harmonic major, kind of like the harmonic minor, but it's just a major scale. So. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna see if that if, if that's the answer he wanted. I don't, I don't know. If, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. know. I don't yeah. know if it was a loaded question or, or he had a true. Uh, but I liked your answer very much. That's the uh, harmonic major, the sound. <laughs> it's weird. It's a weird sound. Yeah. Anyway. Um. So. Let's see here. What's a, what's a good one? So what's something that you feel like, I mean, some of these questions are kind of blurring into similar answers, but yeah, yeah. you know, jazz is something, you know, jazz. <laughs> I know jazz. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so when you're like on a gig with a bunch of jazz guys and they're all, you know, jaded and, and, and been beaten up by just not being appreciated for so long, how do you stay confident and positive, you know? Yeah. That's, that's a real, real one. Um, well, part of the reason, I, I will be honest about this, part of the reason why I'm not doing so many of the wedding gigs anymore is because the musicians on those gigs tend to get pretty jaded. Um, and it, it's hard to be in that environment for any length of time. And the reason why people get jaded is pretty obvious. It's exhausting work. Um, you're not sometimes treated very well um, you put in so much time and energy and you don't feel like some of the stuff that you're doing is being appreciated. And so there's this feeling like, yeah, it's jaded. This is just, it's bad. It's bad vibes, it's bad, bad juju. Um, not all the time, but sometimes that happens. Um, so my default is to just remove myself from the situation, just not be part of it. But I think the important thing for any musician to know is that when you're when you're in a situation with older musicians who might be jaded and i've been very guilty of this before they will complain about things they'll make life miserable for themselves and for you and it's important to not get caught up in it for in any way any way shape or form like not gossiping about people um if it's not important not uh complaining about things if it isn't immediately important for your own immediate getting through the gig um, and that's hard to do because it's alluring to be feel like you're part of things, but it's it's also a very real, real experience with people. And when you're touring, also and like on the road, being jaded and getting dark—that's the technical term. Getting dark. I've gotten dark so so often. I'm very susceptible to getting dark. Um, that's a real battle. It's a very serious battle that every musician has to go through. Um, and I don't have much advice besides to just stay clear of it because it's infectious and it gets gets in you too especially with people who are like who are dark themselves right. um, it's much better and better for the musicianship and better for just the whole process to be with people who are positive thinking um, if there's a bad experience that everybody is sharing to not dwell on that too much and to know that at the end of the experience it's done and that your own reaction to the experience is the only thing that you can control so that that it's a big part of it for sure dude it's it's um the reason why i asked it it um when i saw that question pop up it directly so we did within uh, my group we did something in uh vermont on new year's eve and we, we brought we brought into it um you know myself and my girlfriend sings and our main group of guys couldn't do it so we're just pulling from different things and we brought in this guy jp who's 21 a absurdly monstrous bass player but it was a different type of gig than he had done. And then the keyboard player was a Broadway guy. The drummer was as jaded as they come, beaten down by the system, F the world, blah, blah, blah. And we went on that stage and like the rehearsals were like, uh, this energy isn't flowing. We did the gig and everyone came out of it so positive. It's almost as though like having this young, incredibly talented kid and the Broadway guy and the rest of us, we like healed the drummer. And he was like, music's fun again. And it was so crazy. 
it, it goes to show the importance of the fellow musician, like the personality of the fellow musician and their perspective, because that in influences you. And I'm definitely the, the same, same way. Like, cause I, I want to make sure that the people that I'm playing with are equally as excited as I am, because then I will be excited. And if they aren't, I will be in a bad way. So that's, that's good to hear though. Like, it's, you know, young, young musicians, especially young hungry musicians are very good to have in that environment because they will be excited to do stuff. Um, you don't want to have a young musician you don't want to have them be playing with older jaded, jaded musicians that often because then they will become jaded very quickly. Exactly. Um, you know, I, I played a lot of musical theater um, when I was first uh, playing in New York City and some of the bands that are pl was pl were playing with were all younger musical theater people. And, you know, it was fine, it was fine. Everybody was like excited, but there's a couple gigs with people who are much older and still doing the same kinds of gigs that I was doing. And it was just a bad time. Um, fortunately, I had the foresight to not go and play with those people as much, even though the, the money was pretty decent. Um, but it's it's a very real, real challenge, for sure. Yeah. It's um, you know, a lot of the kids who come through here, they're like, I want to be John Mayer, you know, or I want to be Ariana Grande. I'm like, that's awesome. But the whole purpose of doing this whole thing is to bring in people who are finding other ways to make this thing work as a career yeah. without, you know, the odds of becoming any of those things. I'm more powered than anyone. I hope we all become that, but to be well, able to make it on your own terms and, and find this gig to that gig and be positive, not go dark. That, that's. I, I want to, I want to talk about that because the only way that we see musicians in popular culture and the way that we might get inspired by musicians is to see somebody really like larger than life. Right. But there is, you know, there is a musical middle class of people who are not doing the, you know, Ariana Grande route or whatever, of just being the pop star. And it's, it's a little challenging because we don't um, just as a society, I hate saying as a society, but as a society, we don't see music. Um, we see musicians worth a musician's worth based on their, popularity, their stardom. But um, I think it's important to, to say that there is a much, you know, the vast majority of musicians aren't that. They are working what essentially are nine to fives, but it looks very different than a typical office job. And right. their relationship to work and music is, is very different. Um, and fortunately, I did grow up in a family where I knew that, like my, um, my entire mom's side of the family are all working musicians in one way or the other. So I knew okay. that that was that was a possibility for me. And um, so I, I didn't go into it thinking that I would be rich and famous. I thought that I would be like my mom and my her and her brothers. And I th the more that I've talked to people, the more I realized like, well, people's perspectives and understanding of what working musicians are is very different. And that's, um, it's just a, a, a way of the world, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, that's right. My dad's a drummer too. So it's like, I had like, he was playing, he toured with uh, Johnny Maestro and the Brooklyn Bridge on like revival stuff before I was born. So those stories were always in my house. Yeah. And it said to myself, like, you can make this work at varying degrees, but you can make it work. Yeah. And it's a perspective thing. It's important. Like, uh, I don't, I don't say it's important to have a, um, a parent who is a musician, but the advantages of it are not just be that you become musical and you have a music, at, you know, musical upbringing. I did have a little bit of one. The main advantage for me is perspective. Like I knew how, how a career could be built. And that was a very, that was encouraging in ways that I didn't even really realize at the time because I knew that there would be a path for me. I didn't need, I didn't need to become rich and famous um, becoming like a pop star. I knew that I could do something else for myself and build a career in a different way. And there are so many paths, there's so many ways to do it. And you don't even have to make it your main job, but there are so many things that you can do to make a living playing music and very fulfilling things too. My favorite story I tell, there was a girl um, when I first started and the mom comes up to me and says, you know, don't, don't get too comfortable with her. She's gonna go to college in a year and a half um, and the music will be done for her. And then in the next sentence, she's like, well, my son has a scholarship, he's gonna play baseball. So immediately, you know, what? fast forward now, that girl is in her third year of Oneonta as a fucking music major, so. That's, and it's, and that's the thing is like, um, how many professional baseball players are there, minor league or otherwise, versus professional right. musicians? Right. 
tens of thousands more musicians for sure. Yep. If not way more. That's that's a great, great story. I love it. It illustrates love it perfectly it. too, yeah. And she'll like still send you stuff and she's killing it. She's so creative. It's it's amazing. So that's that's awesome. That's good to hear. Eat it, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, I want to make sure I get everything because this will literally stop directly at seven o'clock in eight minutes. That's um, so good. Yeah. So, thank you so much for your time. Of course, Again, man. This is incredible, and, and these comments. I watched the replay. They are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I... <laughs> yeah. Okay, someone's here saying one of these guys said uh, this kid JP, the bass player, we put. He just wrote that his teachers always told him to have a backup plan. Blah blah blah. And uh, he quit college and is now focusing on music. Because he didn't want to have a backup plan. He wanted to make this work. Yeah, backup plans tend to, ha tend to become the, the plan if you hold on to it a little bit too tightly. I, I never really had a backup plan. I knew that I would do something in music, and I have. And what I've been doing has changed radically year to year. Like, I mean, this YouTube thing has become my main thing, but only the past couple of years. Before that, I was like wedding band guy, and I was doing like a... Um, admin stuff for wedding bands and before that i was musical theater guy before, you know like there's all these little completely different career paths that i've, I've taken right. but i never really had a backup plan so that's the way to do it man that's how i got like i was touring i didn't make any money and then uh had a couple endorsements along the way so i thought i was a big deal but that doesn't pay you any money <laughs> and then uh started doing the cover band thing and then the school thing one thing led to another and here we are but it, it's cool to be able to do so many different things all as a musician, you know? It's not a yeah. dirty word anymore. For sure. Hopefully it's not. Hopefully it's not. <laughs> but it, it might be changing, but hopefully, hopefully it isn't. Yeah. yeah. Um, so any, any new music we should know about? Anything you're super into that you want to hip us to? Um, oh, man. Well, I, I just checked out Dua Lipa's record, new record, the pop singer and... It's a, it's a cool record because there's some really great bass lines on it, like played by bass guitar. That's the always... single piano there had a good bass line. Yeah, and they're all like that. Like the production on that, there's all these really great bass lines. And I've noticed in the past couple of years in pop records, there's electric bass is now becoming much more prominent in, in uh, the production, which I think is super cool. Super like quantized and chopped up, but the sound of an electric bass is very prevalent. Um, so I think that's cool. I mean, I haven't, um, I haven't been checking out too much new in the past, like, couple months. Um, a lot of the stuff that I listen to is old. <laughs> Very that's old. Okay. But, yeah, I, I like the Dua Lipa record. It's nice. Cool. I'll check out that, the first single I taught that to many students here, so I'll go deeper. In it's, it's, a, it's a similar vibe. It's a yeah. similar sound, yeah. Cool. Um, any new original stuff coming out? Sungazer stuff or Aberdeen or... Yeah, uh, well, some guys are, we're writing some new material right now because everybody's in lockdown, so we can spend the time. So nothing, nothing to announce officially. Um, but one of the things that I've been doing a lot on my Instagram is I've been posting, uh, my friend Ben Levin has this whole thing called uh, fake guitar, yeah, where, so you know, like, all the, you know, there's all this controversy on Instagram of some guitarists who, like, speed up their stuff. And Ben has, like, really leaned into that and tried to create a genre of guitar playing that's, you know that it's fake, but it's just right. sounds really cool. So I've started working with him on like a bunch of more fake projects and that's kind of a fun, fun little side project. <laughs> I had a very brief conversation with him at NAMM and he was very friendly, but I was uh, kind of overly hyped up. So I don't know how I presented, but it was fun. Yeah, NAMM is a, NAMM is a crazy, crazy environment. It's hard to make any kind of meaningful connections, but it is nice to always, you know, run into people. So. I was like, I was out of the corner of my eye. I was like, I know that guy. I know that guy. It clicked. And I was like, hey. And he's like, okay. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Actually, uh, on my side of things, we have a, uh, so my girlfriend's been writing songs like crazy. And she has a song that's kind of about what's going on in the world right now. Yep. Um, so later on tonight, she's actually posting that on Instagram. So that's exciting. An hour oh, cool. I'll check it out for sure. Yeah. There's a yeah, lot of great music. There's a lot of great music being made in posted right now there's this um i guess it's collective called stay at home records where it's like all these um musicians uh session musicians who are out of work have started like just collaborating on these these That's awesome. yeah um uh yeah it's it's an it's a weirdly exciting time because there's a lot of people making music now that they can't make music <laughs> yeah <laughs> which makes no sense but it kind of does <laughs>
where it's just all of a sudden, like whenever we can like see people again, there's just going to be, you know, triple albums and, and just this onslaught of music coming out. And that's kind of cool, I guess. It's a silver lining to an otherwise terrible situation for sure. Yes. yes. Yeah. All right, my friend, this, this is going to cut us in, in less than a minute. So I just thank you so, so much, man. I really appreciate of course. it. This is huge. And then uh, it'll be on the replay for 24 hours. And then we're going to do a podcast with bits of it. So cool. Yeah. And thank you so much for having me on. This is a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, the questions were great. Like, um, it, it's fun to talk to, to people also and just fellow musicians who are who are in the same boat, honestly. Yeah. Um, so thank you for having me on. For sure. Awesome. No, but seriously, thank you so much. This was the highlight of uh, my birthday yesterday. So this is my hey. birthday. So thank you. <laughs> All right, brother. We'll All talk right, to you. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank you.